Hello, everyone. Welcome to New Music Paths. Today, I have an amazing guest with me. But first, I'd like to thank Alberta Foundation for the Arts for all the support. Uh, this second season is only happening because of them. So, thank you. And I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Jeremy Brown. He is an award-winning saxophonist, conductor, author, composer, and he's the professor uh, at the University of Calgary. So, uh, Jeremy, one thing that I really admire about you is that you navigate both uh, jazz and the classical world. So, first question is, which one came first when you're learning your saxophone? And also, uh, how exploring both worlds uh, shaped you as a musician? I suppose um, classical came first, and largely because growing up in the Spokane Valley, uh, in a suburban area, there wasn't just a lot of um, authentic jazz experiences available. That said, we had terrific music education um, programs. So right from the get-go, I was studying classically, but playing in these jazz ensembles. But the thing is, I wasn't doing a lot of listening and improvisation. So uh, for me, jazz is it's like a language, of course. It's a shared language. And I, to this day, I'm still working at learning that, that language on the foundation of my classical background, I'd say. Um, how it shaped me, um, I can only guess that perhaps the, the sound that I get on my instruments is a combination, a melange of a little bit of jazz and classical and not strictly one or the other. classical or jazz like you you have this uh, influence from each other mm-hmm. all the time mm-hmm. uh, in your in your performances yeah right? I think it it opens up the, f- the freedom of expression um, that that I feel when I'm playing even say the Scaramouche of Mio or the William Albright Sonata I think to myself okay this is a great it's kind of str- not strict but a classical approach but if I were doing this coming from my jazz Uh, uh, corner, how might I look at it differently? So, uh, and I might not, uh, but s- uh, at other times I think it does influence how I might phrase something or uh, taper off the end of a, f- uh, a note or attack it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a it's a consideration all the time. Well, when you're focusing on details, right? I think classical take you a lot of that road of really pay attention to some some details and, yeah. and jazz too. To be honest, it's hard now to say. Uh, oh, jazz and classical, exactly because of musicians like you, right? Because I had professors uh, back in Brazil, even that uh, were also navigating both worlds, and mm-hmm. and they were jazz players, and yeah. they are really paying attention to details and all the sort of. Thing. So it's it's kind of becoming this complete musician that, you know, music, and not necessarily one or the other. Like you have to choose because. <laughs> yeah, I. I encourage my my students, um, and I hope they f- ultimately find that it's useful to them in their careers to stay open to the world of music, not just classical, but jazz, and free improvisation and um, world musics, and you know, just um, be interested in and keen to pop music as well. Creativity is like a, a chest with all your experiences and what you listen, right? I find when I compose, um, every time I compose, because I listen to so many new things already, I'm a, I'm a different 
person already. Like uh, everything I listen, if I listen to some Chinese music or some Malaysia, or and that start getting into your you no know, chest of creativity and all yeah. your experiences, and that start reflecting how you play, how you compose, and that's right. I think the the last oh I don't know twenty twenty five years of my career, I've been very enthusiastic about improvisation and uh, not just jazz improvisation, but f free improvisation, so non-referential, um, non which I find to be uh, extremely liberating because there is no kind of shared, well, there is a shared vocabulary, but it's pretty much what you want to say as a musician and the sounds that you make and how you create some uh, shape and um, phrasing to the, the sounds that you're making. So I'm, I've been very enthusiastic about that the last few years. We're especially working with Joe Morris in Boston uh, on some projects. So that's kept me fresh. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, you guys uh, just recorded an album, right? Yep. And called Magnitudes. And you'll be releasing that next year? That's right. Yeah, on a Polish record label. And uh, yeah, I think we, we did eight or nine tracks on clarinet, saxophone, flute, slide flute, um, and then he's a fabulous guitarist, and um, so it was all free improv, and just the, t the two of us on these varied combinations of instruments. We basically just sat down and looked at each other and, and said, who goes first? Uh, yeah, I love doing that too. Um, <laughs> yeah, because it started like trying to find coherence and creating you know, gesture, ideas become gestures that becomes phrases and become it's so and like and nothing of that existed a few minutes ago that's right <laughs> and it's it's very expressive to you like you understand what you're trying to say i think it's challenging for listeners to decipher what it is what you know what's he saying what does what does this mean uh, but there is a there is an emotional impact i think once you you make the effort to try to understand what the artists are doing. So what gets you so excited about new music? Because you're constantly doing that like, every year. As a saxophonist, we, a classical saxophonist, our world of repertoire is new. I mean, the instrument was invented <clears throat> in about 19, uh, 1840. And uh, so it came late into the game. So we're, uh, saxophonists are always looking for, you know, interesting, good new music because we just don't have a body of repertoire that goes back hundreds of years. So that's part of it. I think the other part of it is that essentially being an immigrant to Canada, as I am, uh, I'm enthused about this culture and looking for a connection to it as an artist and commissioning was a way of, I think, somehow getting closer to what, what the, the germ or the, the nut of being Canadian is, at least that. When I was a younger man, I think that's what my impulse was. And as time has gone on, it, it was also a way of, um, of course, supporting a culture and a network of uh, young composers, many of them former students, friends, colleagues, um, and creating something that I think there's a need for and something that I thought I could be helpful in doing. You commissioned many works, but you played a lot of Canadian works, uh, meaning by Canadian composers, right? Um, so I, I'm wondering, have you ever, or have you noticed 
any like trends or elements or marks because you've played a lot of Canadian music. Uh, Canadian music, to, to my uh, ears anyway, there's maybe not quite such an identifiable strain. Again, I risk, run the risk of offending mm -hmm. uh, composers, but Canadian composers. But one thing that I, I have found in all the works that I've uh, commissioned and played is that they're just also different. But they're also approachable, and that would be maybe a second thing I would say is that they're not necessarily esoteric for being, just for being esoteric or unapproachable. There's a certain kind of friendliness to the piece that invites you to want to play it and to learn it. Mm -hmm. And I found that other uh, musics of other cultures, a little less so, a little less, you know, eh, I'm not so interested in playing this kind of piece. Is it, is it really worth learning this? Mm -hmm. Canadian pieces, I think, are, you know, a little bit more friendly. <laughs> 